Hey, how's it going everybody? It's your boy Media Kaiser here, back again with another challenge run. Today we're going to be tackling Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, and I'm going to be trying to beat the game with just the Grail Mercenaries. Now, there's going to be a few rules regarding this, so it's going to be, of course, only the Grail Mercenaries. What a shocker. I'm not going to include Shinon or Gaetri for reasons I'll discuss kind of later. Basically, they're traitors. I'm also not going to be using any stat boosters, no forges, and no battle experience, or using bands at all. Any of that stuff. I'm just marking off the table. The reason I'm doing that is just because I have a feeling that this run isn't going to be too bad because the Grail Mercs are pretty strong. At least they're insanely strong in Radiant Dawn, so I was like, ah, let's see how good they are in Path of Radiance. I know from my last run that Ike is really good, but let's see what happens when I partner up him with some of his buddies. So guys, before I jump into the challenge, just want to go ahead and say if you haven't subscribed and you really enjoy my content, go ahead and hit that sub button. You can always unsubscribe later. It really does mean a lot. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that. So let's just kind of just jump into the challenge, shall we? I'm just going to skip the first eight chapters because nothing is different here from a normal run. So I'll just start from chapter nine, Gallia. But before I really go into that, I'll just go over kind of the team stats at this point. Not surprisingly, Ike is the highest level. He is level 12. Titania is level three. Mia is level 7, Soren is level 9, Reese is level 8, Oscar is level 9, and Boyd is level 9. So pretty even all across the playing board. Of course, Titania is being used a little bit, and Titania is going to be quite the savior, because she's known for being one of the two best Jagans in existence, her and Seth. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with where we stand so far. I kind of made everyone kind of have their uses. But anyway, let's just go ahead and get into this. So we get Mist and Rolf right off the bat, and that round outs our nine player team. So just from the start, we're just gonna have everyone basically. So Rolf and Mist are both level one, Rolf being an archer and Mist being a cleric. So not exactly the best classes in the world, but we'll have to make it do. Most enemies here are level 10 plus, so it's gonna be a little scary, especially for my newcomers. Rolf is just gonna be able to get some damage in here and there, and I'll just have Mist heal basically at any opportunity. At least the one good thing with Rolf is he does have his own personal bow the Rolf's bow which gives extra weapon experience which is going to be great for his measly e rank and bows and it's equivalent to about the strength of an iron to steel bow so what i do in this chapter is i send all my units towards the beach area while i direct mordecai and leith to the corner so they don't interact with any enemies i do the same thing when marcia comes up because again she's not a part of the grow mercenaries so i hide her in the back while all of my units are moving up to that beach area i do leave boyd and titania behind in order to just clear up some of those southern enemies that come behind us in pursuit. Not all of them are going to aggro, but some of them will, so I just go ahead and do that real quick. I try to track down the pirates before they can destroy the village, but I'm not fast enough unfortunately. But eh, it's a restore staff and a talisman. I really don't care. This restore staff might be useful in the future, but again, I'm not using any stat boosting items, so talismans only going to be useful for money. And as we'll see later on, I don't exactly struggle for money in this run. So I beat down Natata, the pirate, and then move south to deal with the main boss, Kototh. Kototh is a halberdier with a night killer, so going to range is going to be safer. Especially considering Oscar and Titania might get over by this, especially Oscar. Titania might be able to survive, but Oscar, no way. So he doubles almost everything in my army, so I have to chip at him away with my Kanto units. And then once he's low enough, Soren decides to land the finishing blow. We move on to chapter 10, prisoner release. So you have two options in this chapter. You can either go stealthy or go balls to the wall. So obviously I choose the later. We like a little bit of chaos here. I can Oscar go out to alert the guards. Then the rest of the squad stay back in order to deal with the reinforcements. So immediately once you alert the guards, there's going to be like a group of reinforcements. So it's just easier for me to just stay back and deal with them before I have to do any other things in this chapter. One thing that'll definitely be a pain here is once again, I have another run without a thief. But thankfully, this game lets you bash down doors. So that means we don't need to get door keys, really. We only need to try and get chest keys. I rescue all of the prisoners because why not? Rest in peace to my favorite character, Natalia's duology. I can't use her this run, damn it. I love Nephany, so what a great character. That unfortunately means no good maxing for me. Oh no, I can't be a gooner. Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, anyway, Danamil. Danamil the boss, he's kind of scary. He's got like 14 defense, 17 strength. He's a general and it's pretty terrifying for this early on in the game. But I block him with Titania and pelt him from afar with Soren. I don't know if I like pelt. There's a couple of treasure chests here. I grab whatever is useful, which is mainly the weapons. And then I move on to chapter 11, Blood Runs Red. 
Decently difficult chapter here due to how open it is. It's probably one of the largest chapters in this game. I completely decide to ignore the right side of the map, meaning I don't have to deal with Jill, Seacark, and hopefully the Black Knight. That entire right side of the map is just not worth the effort. <laughs> really? The combination of mages and cavaliers here are really scary to my arm composition because my resistance units are frail and my defensive units are bad against magic. And let's go ahead and just rip off this band-aid and bring up the biggest issue in this run so far and probably moving on to the future, Reese and Mist. They are so unbelievably frail, like at least in most other games healers can take like a single hit and then survive, but these two will die to a freaking splinter, so the escort missions will kind of really unfortunate to go through. Soren does kind of have that same issue, but he's less frail, like he can take at least one or two hits, so I'm not as worried about him. But Reese and Mist are going to be a struggle to deal with this game. As I make my way downtown, walking fast, places pass I'm homebound. -na 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 -na. I run across another roaming boss in Makoya. What a name. The names in this game are just so weird. But anyway, he's an Archer Paladin, so the chances that he's going to one-shot my weaker units are pretty much 100. That does unfortunately happen like once, so I do have a reset due to the unfortunate poor placement of my units. That's usually what the problem is, it's poor placement. Like, I'm dealing with this initial group of enemies, and then I realize, oh shit, the boss is roaming, so he can get to that point from A to B in like two seconds. That's another scary thing with this game, is a lot of the bosses are roaming. So that's fun to deal with, which means it takes a little bit more strategy to actually work around these guys. But I digress. It doesn't help that he also has Kanto, so he can do a drive-by shooting on my ass, but eventually he falls after getting jumped by my Mia, Oscar, and Boyd. I'm able to avoid the Black Knight before he decides to go all stabby-stabby on me, and I make it out safely alive somehow. It really helps that he only like moves three tiles. But we move on to chapter 12, A Strange Land. Oh, I hate this chapter. It's not the worst, but... So, if you guys have ever seen Alfred Hitchcock's movie, Birds, this is essentially this chapter in a nutshell. It, it's a completely all Lagoos chapter. Just Raven Lagoos, that's all we got here. There just aren't enough resources here for me to protect my frail units from the onslaught of these ravens. It's just frustrating, honestly. So, turning on ranges is my best friend here. Mia isn't dodging quite as much as I really hoped she would going into this run. You'd think, alright, so she's a Myrmidon, pretty good avoid. I'm able to use her as a dodge tank, but honestly, that's been not that prevalent so far. Maybe later on she'll get better, but I guess just because she's really good in Radiant Dawn doesn't necessarily mean how she's amazing in Path of Radiance. They're two entirely different games. But anyway, Titania, Oscar, Boyd, and Ike have to do all the heavy lifting here, while Soren and Rolf make the occasional pot shot, and then Reese and Mist just kind of hide in the corners. Chapter felt honestly more like a puzzle than anything, and I had a really annoying amount of resets on this one, more than I'm comfortable with admitting. Oscar's big problem right now is he can take a beating, but he really doesn't have that much strength. So, I mean, that's kind of probably going to be a decent thing, but Ike has the same issue where he can just take more hits and do damage. But I guess that's good because I have so many frail units that it's like, all right, it kind of offsets the frailness a little bit. And that also does mean I have to rely on Titania more than I really would like to. But again, it is it is what it is. I'm making use of the resources I set myself up with. But next we deal with the boss Seeker. And again, what a shocker, he goes down to Titania. Not too difficult, thankfully. Seeker doesn't really stand out from his Raven compatriots. So we're able to move on to chapter 13, Guiding Wind. Ooh, this one was a bit of a doozy. This is a defense chapter in which you have to defend a certain point for 10 turns, which doesn't sound terrible. Gaetri is here, but you need to recruit him with Astrid first, and that's because the big man has turned into a tier 3 sub. She dies before I can even get to her, so that's the main reason I didn't grab him. I mean, that and the fact that I, A, I wanted to make the run harder, and two, they both, Gaetri and Sheenon, left the Grail Mercenaries, so I kind of view them as traitors and death to deserters, that's what I say. But the objective here is to stop all the enemies from reaching the inside of the middle ship. I basically have to either have Titania or Oscar hide on that tile because they have Kanto, so they can attack and then move back if need be. 
There's a big variety of enemies here. You've got archers, mages, halberdiers, and even raven lagoos. Treasure chests are on the map, but the raven lagoos decide to go for them, so it's really hard to focus on both the offensive and defensive at the same time. And after a few failed attempts of trying to get the treasure chest, I just decide to ignore them and focus on living. The wolf does get in some nice shots here, especially with those raven lagoos, because they're essentially like pegasus. They're weak to arrows. And he's shaping up not not too bad so far. I'm honestly quite happy with how Rolf's, the direction his training is heading. But I ignore the boss Norris, a sniper, and let him just do whatever he wants to Gaytree. He ends up killing him. Your sacrifice won't be in vain though, because it's going to let me complete the chapter. Because the last turn, I run like a little bitch, and then I move Titania onto the objective. Everyone else goes back to the first ship. Uh, honestly, that turn, she does more damage to the enemies than I think I did that entire chapter. I do kind of feel bad about br abusing my broken Jagan, but you know, it's the rules I set, so whatever. Next up, we move on to chapter 14, training. We got a nice little detox chapter after the last one. This one's a fog of war, but it's really not too bad. That stupid Malakoff guy is in this chapter, so we just completely ignore his useless ass. I do not like his character at all. He's like Astrid's brother or something, I think that's the lore. Just kind of cringe, bad unit. I've got Oscar, why would I need a crappy, uh, crappy cav like that? So, because of the fog of war in this chapter, I just decided to take things very, very slow. I have Titania head left to grab that village real quick, while I use my normal vanguard, so that's, you know, my boy to Ike, Oscar, to cross the bridges. Soren and Rolf deal with some of those flanking units, there's like one or two on the right side of the map, and that's... The simple strategy I use here, nothing too crazy, honestly. I make my way up to the boss area, which means I did lose out on the second and third village, but I'm not concerned because it was a skill and a stat booster, and I'm not allowed to have either of those two, so the only thing I'm missing out is on a little bit of extra experience, so who cares? The boss, Gasha Lama, Jesus Christ, these names, has some scary tiger lagoos with him, but it's a defeat boss chapter, so thankfully I can just ignore those guys and just bum rush the boss and with that ike is one level off being max really close and we move on to chapter 15 the feral frontier good old desert chapters don't you just love them thankfully this one is not nearly as bad as i'm used to dealing with at least i feel the will to live through this one titania and oscar are pretty much useless here due to their limited move in desert so this is going to be soren's time to shine basically rolf also does put in a fair bit of work here as all of the lagoos are one range so while lagoos are really strong and scary they've obviously got the the crux of only having one range and also they can only be in their animal form for certain amount of time. Ike maxes out here at level 20 with 34 HP, 12 strength, 4 magic, 18 skill, 18 speed, 12 luck, 16 defense, and 9 resistance. So after looking at the averages, I do have a very defensive Ike, but his strength is kind of lacking. But I'm honestly okay with this because my other units are more frail, so I'd like to have my Ike kind of just be able to tank some hits. We also have another person that caps. We got Soren. Soren caps with 29 HP, 0 strength, 19 magic, 18 skill, 17 speed, 7 luck, 3 defense, and 16 resistance. On average, my Soren is more frail in defense and resistance, but he has more magic, skill, and speed. So I'm completely okay with that. As I said, I got Ike who's defensive and I got Soren who's offensive, so it balances out. For once, I do get all of the sand treasures that, that I think I'll need. So that's gonna be like the white gem, the boots, the silver blade, the shine, and the physic. Generally speaking, I tend to forgo these because they're a pain in the ass. Uh, I just kind of was like, all right, maybe there's a couple here that are pretty good. And missing out on a pair of boots would be awful. And same thing with the white gem, that's free 10 grand. The boss Murum here is not really that much of an issue. Same sort of thing with the Lagoos. He does not move off of the spot he's protecting, and he doesn't have two range, so I am chillin'. Next up is chapter 16, The Atonement. Ah, uh, this is the chapter that we get to see Oliver. Ah, uh, doesn't everyone just adore Oliver? You know that creepy guy that really wants to just bang racing? Ah, good old Fire Emblem. You never fail to amaze me. Anyway, I digress. Soren becomes a sage here, and that's why I love this game, because you will automatically promote when you get to level 21 in this game. They do have master seals, which are few and far between, but again, you don't need them if you just level up to level 21, which makes it kind of hard if you want to do like an unpromoted run only challenge, which 
isn't really going to happen. So, but I think it's a beautiful idea. Honestly, I love this concept. So I decided to spec Soren's second weapon into a staff because knives are pretty much useless on this guy. He has zero strength. So why the hell would I need any knife users? I mean, having knife users isn't the terrible thing, it's just the fact that he has air strength which really uh, downplays that. Again, I can never have too many healers, so I spec into healing. Another pretty easy chapter here, it's just kind of a slog to get through. There's a lot of treasure chests here that I can't open, so that kind of sucks, but you know, it is what it is. I'm not too worried considering that this hasn't been the worst challenge so far but that'll change soon. I digress though. I leave Titania behind to deal with the flanking reinforcements, and I decide to murder Devdan in cold blood with a child character for added irony. Wolf destroys him, and just, just the look on Devdan's face when I kill him with Rolf is just funny. He's like, no, I can't fight a child. Bro will remember this for a long time. All right, we got another unit that hits max here. Boyd goes ahead and hits his max with 40 HP, 16 strength, one magic, 14 skill, 15 speed, 9 luck, 9 defense, and 3 resistance. Void is kind of iffy. He's underperforming in almost all areas except for skill and speed. That's barely so. That's like, uh, great. I have a kind of shitty Void, but I suppose I had a decent Ike and a decent Soren, so it's just my luck to have a bad Void. So, yeah, it is what it is. The boss Kamarsi isn't that strong, so I use him as a chance for Void to get his class change into Warrior. Because I'm like, all right, well, if his stats are this bad, I might as well just jump ship and get right into promoting. And, oh god, I'm dreading this next chapter. Next up, we move on to chapter 17, Daybreaks. If you haven't played this game before, you're in for a fucking doozy. This is a four-part chapter into one. So what that means for us is you're essentially going to have to load up your squad with plenty of items. Fill up every unit with full inventories because there is no break here. And when I mean no break, that's going to be no base phase between said chapters. If you go from 17.1 to 17.2, the only thing that you're allowed to bring with you is two extra units, nothing else. So no more extra items, you can't forge, you can't add battle experience, you just have to go straight into it. Prepare yourselves for some fun times. Though at least the one silver lining here is individually they're not that bad, but it's just the hole that makes it the pain in the ass. So the first part is a route chapter. Not too difficult here, I just make sure I only pull a few units at a time. There are flanking enemy reinforcements only a couple of turns in, so I want to make sure that I'm dealing with those enemy reinforcements before I really try and tackle the rest of the enemies on the map, because I don't want to pull too much at one time. And that kind of works. I think I end up having to reset like once or twice just because of the normal problem with Reese and Mist. But, you know, we kind of vibe here. Part two is an arrive chapter, so this is easier. All I have to do is make sure that I have my normal vanguard be the rear guard. So Oscar, Titania, and Void are going to sit in the back while Ike and Mia and kind of some other units decide to just charge through because there is kind of like a swampy area here. So it's better for my horsemen to stick back and just kind of protect the rear. Doing this, Oscar is able to hit his max level here. A lot of max levels. So he's got 35 HP, 12 strength, 6 magic, 15 skill, 17 speed, 11 luck, 17 defense, and 2 resistance. Similar vibes to Ike where he is strength weak but has a nice defense to make up for it. Part 3 is definitely the worst part because it's a survive chapter, so the objective here is to just survive 10 turns. Ike is carrying Leanne, who is a heron, so his speed is going to dip a little bit, but she doesn't have much weight, so it's really not as big of a deal as, you know, you make it out to be. But it's important to put Ike on more of a defense, which is good for him because he's defensive anyway. I have all my units hide in the top left while Titania acts as bait to give me more time to set up in the corner. There are reinforcements inside corner, but it's not as bad as being surrounded on multiple sides. I promote Oscar here and give him swords as a specialization. Now the reason I kind of do this is because I have two good axe users and I don't really need to spec into bows because it's probably not a good idea for me to have multiple units that are using bows. So I was like, all right, sword is kind of like that good middle ground. So there's some decent swords that you can get away with having lower strength, whereas axes, you don't really have that luxury as much. Guess who also pops their level 20 here? Mia. Mia pops level 20 with 27 HP, 13 strength, 5 magic, 18 skill, 20 speed, 12 luck, 7 defense, and 6 resistance. So what a shocker, Mia caps speed here. She is slightly more frail than the average one, but again, she has a little bit more strength and skill than average. So I'm okay with that kind of, she's a frail unit anyway, so it's like whatever. 
She also promotes into a Swordmaster this chapter, so that's pretty cool. We're almost all of our units have been promoted here. Wow, we just have like three left. Just Rolf, Mist, and Reese. All right, and part four. Part four is a defeat boss chapter. That's a lot harder enemies than what we've had before, before we've had to deal with like, like Myrmidons, Soldiers, the occasional Cav, the occasional Paladin. Nothing too crazy, but this chapter has a lot more Generals, Paladins, and those enemies come in big groups. So in order to kind of counteract this, I just group up as much as humanly possible to so make it so tight knit that nothing can really squeeze in. And I just deal with like small little groups of those bigger groups at a time and just hope and pray that some of the enemies are going to miss. Honestly, this one was the most scariest because I, I didn't want to get to this point and then fucking die because that would suck. All you really have to do is get like halfway through the chapter because you get Janoff, Olki, and Tabarn. They show up as green units to help out. So the chapter's basically over at this point. I, again, I have no qualms using green units at all. It's not like I could stop Tabarn even if I wanted to. But at least the nice thing is here, Oscar is able to sneak in and get the boss kill on Oliver before Tabarn finishes him off. And I'm done with the pain in the ass chapter. Yippee! We move on to chapter 18, Crimea Marches. Freedom! Is this what Braveheart felt like? At least the good thing about Daybreaks is it does promote Ike into a Lord. Yeah, so we have him as a promoted unit, so that's nice. We don't have to worry about him being capped at level 20 anymore. This chapter starts using more Bolting Tome guys. We love ranged attacks, don't we? Thankfully, they're pretty inaccurate. I don't think a single one of them hits. Besides that, there's not really too many threats in this chapter. The only things to know are Sheenon is here, and I, again, I kind of brought up the no room for deserters argument earlier, so I eradicate him off the face of the earth. There are also some Raven Lagoos and Paladin reinforcements, but they aren't shit, thankfully. The boss Keache. Again, these names are so weird. Kamarsi, Keache. You end up seeing fucking Mr. Gorbachev up here, like Jesus Christ. But he has a very nice tornado tome, and that shit just so happens to drop when you beat him, which is gonna be a nice little, little weapon for our boy, Soren. I would say this is a nice little detox chapter. And again, another nice thing about this chapter is Rolf hits level 20, yay! And I make sure I just milk out those last few ravens at the end to give him that sniper promotion. But anyway, he has 29 HP, 15 strength, 5 magic, 15 skill, 16 speed, 9 luck, 11 defense, and 6 resistance. I have a pretty decent roll for, according to the averages. His strength is over the average, and his other stats are like just over the cusp. So I'm completely okay with this. This is definitely a unexpected unit. I expected him to perform way worse, to be honest. And he's holding his weight really surprisingly. I've never used Rolf before because I've just written him off as Shinon's shittier version. I'd rather just use Shinon. He's like the disappointing brother of the three. It's like basically having Nino if we got it early, which is crazy what a few extra chapters can do for your growth. But anyway, we move on to chapter 19, Entrusted. Okay, this chapter is a lot harder, especially on my healers. A lot of spread out enemies in the opening area, along with some mountain-based Raven Lagoos. On top of that, this chapter has several Ballista units that'll hurt most of my guys if they even get close to them. And the worst part is Naysala. Naysala is here, and Naysala is completely, well, not completely, but almost impossible to beat normally. But thankfully, this is a defeat boss chapter, and he is not the boss. The boss for this chapter is Homasa. Homasa is a sword master, which is kind of annoying, because that means his avoid is going to be pretty decent, especially against Titania. Luckily, though, Titania's hand axe connects, and even more surprisingly is Homasa moves before Naysala on enemy phase and Homasa gets hit once again with that same hand axe and goes down to Titania and I'm able to pull this W out of my ass. We move on to chapter 20, Defending Taurega. I use my two master seals here because I'm just sick of waiting for Reese and Mist to be halfway decent by themselves and I just promote him. So Reese becomes a bishop after promoting and I promote my level 14 giving him light magic so that he can at least fight back. He doesn't just take it, he can at least dish it out a little bit. I mean he has 17 magic which isn't that bad really. Soren was around the same when he promoted, however he's got 10 speed which you're not going to double anything. If anything you're going to get doubled a lot so that's terrifying. 
that basically means he can only make the last hit, and that's about it. He does, however, make up for this fact with his crazy 22 resistance. Unfortunately, the 4 defense mean he still just as frail physically and is only good as a last resort. I mean, that resistance is going to come in nice if I ever have to deal with a bunch of mages, but, you know, that's few and far between. I'd rather just kill the mages outright than have to worry about them attacking me. Mist is even worse promoting at level 10 into a Valkyrie, which means she gets access to swords, but the only sword she can remotely even begin to use is the Sonic Sword and maybe the Rune Sword, which uses magic stats and not strength, because 5 strength stat is not going to do shit. At least the one good thing about being a Valkyrie is she does have Kanto. I was really expecting her to promote and use magic, but maybe I'm thinking of different Valkyries. Anyway, at least now now we have the whole squad promoted, so that's nice. So the chapter itself isn't that bad, but it's slightly stressful just because of how many wyverns there are. It's way too many to deal with in one turn, so I have to unfortunately take care of them during enemy phase. That does mean that Mist and Reese basically have to just hide in the back. Surprisingly though, Rolf can take a beating. I'm really surprised at how good his defense is and his avoid. I'm okay with him taking about the same amount of beating as I am with Soren, if not even more. The boss Shiraham here is definitely one of the more stronger bosses we fought so far because he has a tomahawk with 20 strength and does about like 20 damage to Boyd with said tomahawk, which is pretty scary. I have a pretty simple strategy for beating this boss. It's simple enough. I use my Kanto units. I use Titania and Oscar to do hit and run, which is get in there real quick, get out, and then that clears the area for me to use Ike to beat him up. And then thankfully this is an arrive chapter and not in a route chapter. So I don't have to deal with all of those consistent enemy wyvern reinforcements and then some other like sword master reinforcements that show up as well. And we move on to chapter 21 without a king. This is a style of chapter we've not really dealt with for a hot minute because of just how tight it is. Not a lot of room to move around in to be honest. I do stick all of my units together except for the middle area of the map where Titania and Oscar decide to go south to that small pathway and then the rest just head west. Some annoying stuff happens here, we have some sleep staff users and they put both Ike and Oscar to sleep so yay we get to wait out for 4 plus turns, yay so much fun. This chapter has two bosses in it, so the first is going to be a general that is Kasatai. It sounds like something from Star Wars. He's got a Brave Lance and has no two range, so the Brave Lance is terrifying. Two range means I could just deal with him with Soren and Rolf, and Rolf decides to crit him real quick, so I don't even have to worry about that. Very nice. Good job, Rolf. A lot of chests in this chapter, but I can't really get them because of lack of chest keys, but again, I don't really care. It's whatever. We'll make do with what we have. My funds are over 50k right now, so I am definitely not struggling for money. Really great what happens when you don't have to feed an entire army just nine guys. The hardest part of this chapter is towards the end, when I get flanked on two sides by reinforcements from the north, and then Torneo squad that comes up from the south. I leave Ike and Oscar, my two more defensive units, at the rear, and have Titania plug up the hole in the front, because as long as they can't get through Titania, I'm chilling. Soren is able to support Titania with their help, plus Rolf. We're able to clear out that area and we move up to the boss, Enna. Enna doesn't have two range and is all by herself, so, you know, not gonna be too bad. She has a lot of HP and is pretty physically strong, but still, not having two range is really detrimental against my army, aka my murderers, Soren and Rolf. We move on to chapter 22, Solo. So this chapter is split into three different sections. There's a right, a left, and a middle. So I decided to send all my units split up, Ike and a few others towards the left, and then Oscar Titania to the right. And then they're going to be able to get a few of those treasure chests because there are two enemies with chest keys. So that means I'm going to be able to snag four chests at least. And then I got an extra one with a Feath because a Feath took one and I killed the Feath. So I took the item that the Feath took. But then after that, I converge in the middle area. And the middle area has oh, so many goddamn enemies. A lot of mages this chapter. This means that guess who gets a little bit of time in the limelight? Reese actually has a use. I don't have to worry about him getting murdered going into that mess of enemies. I mean, to be fair, there's some warriors and other units, but again, the majority of them are mages and bishops, clerics, all of those types. And another good thing about this chapter is it's a kill boss chapter, not a route all enemies. So that means I'm able to prioritize dealing with the boss Schaefer. Schaefer does have killer weapons, which is never fun to deal with. Through the combined efforts of Oscar, Soren, and Titania, I'm able to take him down and move on to the Great Bridge, chapter 23. Oh, I hate this chapter. 
If you guys haven't seen, I did do a YouTube short in this chapter, but you know, just for consistency's sake, I'll go over it here. So this chapter is easily the worst chapter so far. I hate this chapter. So the goal of this chapter is to do what PewDiePie couldn't and cross the bridge. However, the bridge is loaded with pitfalls that stun your units for one turn. There are also ballistas and enemy reinforcements from the right. So in order to deal with those enemy reinforcements, I have Mia and Oscar stay behind, and they're able to take care of those reinforcements and murder Har who shows up from that side as well. So I rendezvous in the middle once those enemy reinforcements have been taken care of, and I dealt with a few of the ballistas, and then we move the entire squad as a whole towards the left side, and by that time, the reinforcing green units end up helping us deal with a few of the enemies that are towards the boss's area, so we kind of converge in the middle of there as well after dealing with several ballistas. Titania does do a lot of the legwork for dealing with those ballistas and getting up in their face. However, Rolf is quite paramount in dealing with these guys as well because a lot of the enemies are hiding behind sandbags so two ranges is going to be beautiful on them and Rolf is honestly doing really good work here. At least the nice thing here is the boss Patreon is not very strong at all. Very strong normally but the problem is she does have a flame lance and because she has the flame lance I'm able to use Soren instead and Soren res tanks the boss completely. She does like six damage to Soren which is nothing for his 30 plus HP so completely easy boss to take care of. We move on to chapter 24 battle reunion. Oh I'm done with that bridge Jesus Christ okay so this is an arrive chapter we love those where I decide to ignore the entire left bottom side of the, of the map. While Nihil is a great scroll, I can't use it, so it's whatever, I just decide to ignore it. Which is honestly a blessing in disguise, considering how many goddamn reinforcements there are on this map. So instead, I decide to go up and left, and then I slowly deal with enemy reinforcements. Like, for example, I have Boyd stick behind to deal with reinforcing flyers. I have Mia deal with some flyers as well. It's a lot of reinforcing flyers. Not fun. Also, guess who shows up at the bottom of the map? Black Knight. Don't have any units near him and he won't follow you. He's completely useless. Just don't get near him. While I'm making my way up towards the Arrive area, while there's some green units up with Jeffrey's army trying to defend and kind of help you out, Rolf is actually able to deal with the roaming boss record really easily with a nice crit. Rolf is just mm, so good. I am so shocked. But we move on to chapter 25, Strange Lands. Yay, this is the infamous Boulder chapter. Again, it's not nearly as bad as the Boulder chapter in, in Radiant Dawn, but the goal of this one is to rout all of the enemies, so I'm able to ignore the right side for now and just send all my units up the left path. Again, the thing with the boulders is the enemies will hit the boulders, it rolls down a, a, a certain pathway, and it does 10 damage to anything that gets hit. Now they'll hit enemy units and they'll hit your units together, they don't give a crap. But 10 damage is really not that much to me, so I'm really not that worried about that. The bigger problem comes from a couple of factors. One, my really slow healers, especially missed in this chapter, because horses don't go uphill very quickly, so my range is very limited. Because of that, mist is a liability. Reese is less of a liability, but he's still very weak, and considering there are several wyverns that are sort of in this part, I've reset a lot more than I'm comfortable with admitting. It was a lot of resets. But after enough kind of resets and working my way around this area, I'm able to figure out that I need to just have Ike, Rolf, and Mia deal with all of these enemies. Rolf is my damage dealer, Mia is my dodge tank, and Ike is just my normal tank. There's Tiger Lagoos, which are fucking terrifying. There's some Raven Lagooses. There's some Hawk Lagooses. And just some other Wyverns, including the boss, Grommel. Grommel is a bolt axe using Wyvern Lord, but he's not really that big of a problem because Rolf does what he does best, equips a killer bow and crits the enemy. Also another thing to point out is at the top of the hill there is a ballista, so that is not bueno as the kids say. But after dealing with the boss and clearing up those that little group of wyverns there, the rest of the chapter is not too bad, it's kind of annoying, a lot of resets, shouldn't have been that difficult. I hate my healers, it was honestly just resets because Reese and Miss were getting destroyed. And the occasional unlucky Boyd dying or something like that. Again, clean up the rest of the enemies with no issue, and we move on to chapter 26, Clash. Chapter 26, Clash, is probably the longest chapter we've had so far. There's a lot of enemy reinforcements in decent sized groups. At least the nice thing here is that all of my units play a decent role. Yes, even Yuris. 
It's a pretty simple chapter as long as I just decide to pull small groups at a time. They tend to come in reinforcement waves at about 5 units per, so as long as I gang up in one little batch, I should be chill until the enemy phase happens and then I do the same thing back on player phase. Try not to chew off too much at once, you know? The boss Bertram has a rune sword, but I decide I want to solo him-ish with Titania so she can max out. She does max out and then Soren and Rolf clean up after she's done having her fun. And so this is the moment we've all been waiting for to see how Titania has held up. She's got 46 HP, 22 strength, 5 magic, 24 skill, 22 speed, 24 luck, 18 defense, and 14 resistance. More strength and way more luck than the average. Like, the average luck is something like 18, and I got 24? Are you kidding me? But luck is such an unimportant stat that it doesn't really matter. I mean, it has its uses, but not as much as the other stats. And less speed and magic. I mean, obviously magic doesn't matter, but the speed kind of hits a little bit, especially towards endgame. A lot more units are a lot more faster, but overall, a good Titania. I'm happy with my results. We move on to chapter 27, Moment of Fate. So this is a kind of two-part chapter, but nothing like Daybreaks, thank God. So I have Ike, Oscar, and Rolf head up to the north area right above the staircase and chill there and deal with some of those Lagoos and Swordsmasters. And then I have the rest of the units deal with the left side's warriors and then followed by the right side's generals when they come back on the next turn. A lot of the Lagoos are being integrated into enemy armies. So you have those along with like magic users, Swordmasters, etc. It's just a big variety of units. Same thing with Thieves. And I split up my army into three different groups in order to chase down the faiths and take their treasure. The three different groups are, I have I have Titania, Rolf, and Soren take care of the left side. Then I have, guess who solos the right side? Our boy Oscar. I am very happy that Oscar has picked up his crap as a paladin. Oscar s flies through the right side to snag the faith with a javelin and then bait those other units that are there towards where he came from. And that gives my other army, which is just the rest of my units, Ike, Boyd, Mia, them, to regroup in the middle and kind of converge and take down those units together. And so this first part's boss is Halfield, or Halfed, something like that. He's a sentinel who gets completely destroyed. He's got a Brave Lance equipped. I use my Wombo Combo, which apparently my Wombo Combo is Rolf plus Soren, my two nukes, apparently. Never thought I'd say Rolf is a nuke, but, you know, I'm, okay. I'm honestly okay with this. This is pretty cool. And the second part of this chapter is a 1v1, kinda. It's Ike versus the Black Knight, but Mist is here to give some aid. Honestly, I did need Mist here, because the Black Knight almost one-shots Ike, and Ike does, like, six damage, even with his newly gained Ragnell. Probably one of the best swords in the game. I mean, it is. It's got 18 might and infinite durability. And it's also 1 to 2 range, so Ike can fight back all the time now. He doesn't have to worry about being too ranged. It's great. There are some enemy reinforcements that show up, but they're pretty weak, so that's just free experience. And I unfortunately can't beat the Black Knight, at least with the setup I have, so I just have to wait until Nasir saves my ass instead of beating down Black Knight. And we move on to the penultimate chapter 28, Twisted Tower. This honestly sounds like something from Fortnite. This chapter is covered in a myriad of enemies, including our introductions to the Red Dragon Lagoos. Jesus Christ, I don't know why they're introducing enemies like right near the end of the game, but hey, what do I know? I'm no game designer. So Taberan is here, cool guy, but you know, he's a... He's a nice little green unit, so we're gonna hide him in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner, but you know, we're gonna do that to, to burn. One style of weapon that I kind of glossed over this run are Laguz, anti-Laguz weapons. It's important to have them. You should have had like a Laguz axe, a Laguz sword, Laguz lance. They're gonna be pretty useful in this chapter, especially against all of those red dragons, because those dragons are pretty bad. Get it, bad, bad dragon. We didn't have a very good introduction to Ragnell, against the Black Knight, but the Ragnar is very, very good of a weapon, and it does an amazing job in this chapter, especially considering I can two-range these damn Lagoos. And, I mean, more than chapter 26, there's just a lot going on. The problem with this chapter, more than chapter 26, is those enemies are kind of segmented a little bit, but all of the enemies here, there's like big, big groups. And that doesn't help. There's also Hawk Lagoos that fly in and try and target my squishies. And then there's a Sleep Staff user, which puts Oscar to sleep, so that's not really that helpful. So it does take me a few attempts to get through this chapter and find a decent strategy. Eventually, I'm able to make it through with the help of Rolf, Ike, and a surprisingly Reese. Reese does a lot in this chapter. Reese, I've given him a Nosferatu Tome, and the Nosferatu Tome is able to absorb enemy damage when it 
based off of how much damage it does to the enemy. So let's say it does 22 damage, you're able to, you're going to be able to take at least half of that back in HP, which is certainly good for him because he's so slow that the enemy is going to hit him once, he's going to absorb HP back, and then he's going to get hit again, and that just gives him enough to survive getting hit by one enemy. So it's not the end of the world anymore if Reese gets targeted. That's good, which means I can focus slightly less on trying to save Reese's ass and focus more on actually killing things. It's just my team is so player phase focused that because I don't have a lot of defensive units that these large groups of enemies are just really hard to deal with. It's not really annoying, it's just kind of challenging honestly. This is just a difficult map. It's not like one of my worst levels, it's actually got decent design, it's just difficult. Which is good because it's the second to last chapter. The one thing that isn't difficult on the other hand is the boss. The boss Headwin has a bolting term, so as long as you get close enough, he can't even fight back. He's the easiest boss for like the last 10 chapters, honestly. Kind of pathetic. Hey, I'm okay with this. We move on to chapter end game repatriation. What a weird name. So this is a fucking doozy of a chapter, boys and girls, ladies and gents. Let's get into this. I split up the party into two main groups. On the left side, we have Mia, Boyd, Oscar, and Soren. Soren has a Meteor Tome, which, yeah, funny. will prove it very useful in order to pick off some key units. And it's going to be able to help my right side flank out, because the right side is honestly going to suffer a little bit more. Mia's pretty decent. Again, we know how good Oscar is. Boyd's fallen off a little, but he's still able to get some damage in. I think the scariest part of this chapter, at least in this initial area, are the red dragons as we dealt with on the last chapter. And those are integrated more with regular, your generals, your paladins, your archers, you know, all of that stuff. It's just kind of all together in a mishmash of units that it's like, all right, what do I put where? How do I defend myself? It's just kind of hard to get your mind around like exactly what to do. There's no certain way of winning. It's just kind of hoping and praying. <laughs> But anyway, so that right side has everyone else. So that's Titania, Ike, Rolf, Reese, and Mist is kind of in the middle. The first three, Titania, Ike, and Rolf did most of the work here. And the, the Halo 2 are general liabilities as always. Nothing surprising there. And this chapter, I give all of my good weapons around. I forgot to mention that. I just give everything because it's like, all right, it's the last chapter. I might as well make use of everything I have in my storage area. And that includes a bunch of physics staffs, which will be very important to mention later. This initial area takes me like a good 20 minutes to get through. A lot of resets, unfortunately. I do eventually make it through to the middle of the map. The middle of the map just has a couple of lagoons and a sword master not that big of a deal the problem with the middle area is once you hit a certain threshold ashnard the boss is going to be aggroed he is our final boss for this game he is pretty difficult so what i end up having to do i realize or i try and take down ashnard with my entire army but not really anyone can deal with ashnard without getting completely destroyed in the other side of things except for one individual unit hello Ike. So this is basically, I end the game how I started it, with only Ike-ish. Yeah, kind of. You know, real quick, before we go over the final battle, let's go over our stats at the very end. So we have Boyd at level 17, Oscar at 20, Soren at 20, Titania at 20, Ike at 20, Mist at 15, Reese added a pathetic 11, Mia at 17, and Rolf at 18. So of course our normal units, Oscar really pulled his weight together being a paladin. Soren has been fantastic this entire run. Titania, not a surprise, and Ike, our main lord. It's kind of surprising Boyd fell off for me. I just stopped using him as much because he just hasn't been that great towards the end game where there's a lot more harder units. Boyd does better against squishier units and there's not that many at the end of the game. Mist is done better than Reese just because of her maneuverability. And then Mia and Rolf. Mia fell off a little bit. She kind of got a little bit back with promotion, but same kind of thing with Boyd where I just stopped using her as much because she's better with squishies. Rolf promoted kind of late. I almost got him to max and it's kind of hard because he can't really fight back on enemy phase. So it's hard for him to get experience on enemy phase. He's more of a player phase kind of unit. But anyway, I digress. So Ashnard, right? Ashnard does 26 damage to Ike with his Gurn Grant. And Ike does 9 damage back with the Ragnar. That's pretty abysmal. The good thing here is because Ashnard is nowhere near his throne area, he is completely cut off from any healing. So whatever damage we do to him, he won't heal back, which is paramount to the strategy working. So what I do is I position Ike in such a way that he is in range of Soren, Reese, 
and Mist's physic staffs, but also positioned so only Ashnard will target Ike. That's it. Ashnard has no other units in his range except for Ike, so that means every turn he'll attack Ike. This works, and I'm able to, every time I in turn, Ike is able to heal up by physic staffs. This tedious strat does work. It's on player phase, I'll attack once, heal up, enemy phase, I get hit, I heal up, and then I repeat the process over and over again. This even works throughout the second phase where Ashnard does get stronger, he does an additional five damage, but I still do that same nine damage. Ashnard does have overtime healing though, but it's not enough to counteract the damage. It's about eight per turn, so let's say I do 9 damage per turn times 2 with the enemy phase. That's 18 damage. Each turn, I am getting in exactly 10 damage. His health pool is 140 HP altogether, so I have to do this same strategy for 14 turns straight. It works! It's a simple but easy strategy that I'm able to use to completely destroy him. I beat Ashnard with Ike pretty much solo. I feel kind of bad I didn't use any of my other units at the end, but those physics stats really came in handy, didn't they? This was a really fun run. I really enjoyed this. Rolf was insanely good. I like way better than I expected him to be. But as I said, Boyd kind of fell off. Mia was mid. Oscar redeemed himself towards the end. And my healers were trash. Mist was all right. Titania was our most used unit, which is not surprising at all. Surprisingly, Soren was number two, not Ike. Soren got more kills than Ike did, which really shocks me. I guess it's because I stopped using him. I stopped using Ike a little bit more towards the middle of the game because he wasn't promoted and he was maxed out and I didn't want to give blank experience. But regardless, I don't want to take that away from Soren. He did a fantastic job as a nuke unit and I'm really happy with this outcome. This has been such a fun run. I appreciate you guys for watching. Thank you so much. My name has been Meteor Kaiser and I will see you in the next run. But until then, as always, peace.